Today, I have the honor of speaking with Tan Lee. And Tan is founder and CEO of Emotive, a San Francisco headquartered neuroinformatics company. And we will speak today about the subject of brain computer interface technology. So a huge welcome to you, Tan. And what inspired you to create a neurotech company? So thank you, Patricia. Thank you for having me. Um, I was inspired many, many years ago to explore the work in brain computer interface because there were a few things happening um, in our world. The first is that we're living much longer lives. So it puts a huge strain on the need for us to start thinking about how do we preserve the well-being and longevity of our brain and the resilience of our brain. Um, the other thing that was also happening is, um, you know, the World Health Organization had actually run some numbers around the, the number of people in the world that are impacted by neurological impairments. And this number was a staggering figure of one in three. So within the course of your life, you will be impacted. One in three individuals will have some sort of be impacted in some way by neurological impairments. So that's a staggering number. If you think about the, the, the burden of this condition, whether it be ADD, ADHD, autism, um, injury from stroke or trauma, um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all of the dementia, all of the aging related neural developmental disorders as well. So it's a massive challenge. Um, and then against that is the backdrop of the massive a technological evolution in artificial intelligence that we were starting to see as well. So how do you even keep up um, if we don't actually find ways to preserve this system in our heads that actually define our experience? So I felt it was such an exciting, inspiring field to start to pursue. So that's what got me hooked into um, brain computer interface technology because it allows you a vantage point to start to address so many of these complex uh, conditions. So you've been running Emotive for over a decade. So what's changed in brain computer interface technology over those 10 years? So from, from our standpoint, there's been a lot of things that we've worked on over the last decade. I think the first thing um, for any organization tackling this brain computer interface um, space is you start first with hardware. So the when I first started, the technology, you typically only study brains when something is wrong with it. If you have a sleep disorder, if you have seizures, if you have some sort of neurodevelopmental disorder, um, you'll actually study your brain, but typically something is wrong. You don't study brains when it's healthy, normal, um, and you certainly don't study brains in the context of the real world. And so we started first by creating different types of devices, like these are some of our devices. This is our latest, which looks like a pair of headphones, but these are tools that allow us to start to change when, where, and why we actually start to look at what's going on in the human brain. The second phase was we started to look at software that allows us to structure data that we can collect from the brain. So, you know, as part of introducing these um, brain devices, brain measurement devices, we have to also have a way to benchmark these against clinical systems. So that was part of the hardware work. But once the hardware was benchmarked, then the next phase is really about how do you help people who are collecting data in the field structure that data so that when it comes back into a repository, you can actually measure and, and start to conduct research on it. So make it easy, create tools, software tools that make it easy to structure this, this data that was coming in from all around the world. And this phase that we're moving into now is all about looking at large scale data and brain models that we can derive from the data that we've collected now in across more than 140 plus countries. Wow. So I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and I can already see them coming in. But maybe we just before we finish up, maybe we'll I'd ask you about some exciting things that, that you have been involved in during your journey in emotive. So I would say um, a couple of things that I really love. The first are um, stories where our technology has really made an impact on an individual's life. One of my favorite um, stories is the work that we're doing with BCI for Kids. It's a group in Calgary in Canada, and it's for children who have some sort of neurodevelopmental condition, whether it's B um, CP or they have difficulty with movement in, in some form. 
and we're able to create really simple interfaces with our devices and the software toolkit to uh, enable the children to draw, to create music, to find new ways to um, inspire them um, and to allow them a way to interact with the world. So that's very, very rewarding, really challenging um, um, opportunities. But, you know, when you start to see how people apply their creativity to solve for some of these, um, the needs for some of these children, it's just really, really exciting and wonderful. Another thing that I really am excited about, which we will see um, in stores this year is a collaboration with L'Oreal, the world's largest cosmetics company. Um, one of their brands, uh, East Saint Laurent, is a kind of a chic premium brand. They are rolling out with a an experience called Sensation. So imagine walking through a store today, you know, when you get sprayed in Neiman Marcus or one of the big department stores, um, you don't really know what fragrance you really like as you smell like a hodgepodge of all sorts of things. Uh, now you can actually smell just a few ingredients that make up a fragrance, depending on how your brain responds to that, for, uh, that's, that base note. We can predict with very high degree of accuracy which fragrance the beauty advisor can recommend to you. So like a makeup session, but for fragrance. So really, really fun, very enjoyable, uh, really new way of uh, thinking about applying this technology in a commercial setting. Wonderful. And look, so many questions, I am sure, because I know I do. But maybe just before we move on to those audience questions, you could maybe tell us about the biggest challenges that BCI is facing, brain computer interface technology is facing. Yeah, I think um, the biggest challenge I see us facing is one of really societal acceptance and understanding and awareness of what the technology can and cannot do. I think that's with introduction of any uh, sort of technology like this, one of the hardest, most difficult things to grapple with is how do you move societal awareness alongside with the technological development. And so what we see with brain computer interface technology as a space is that you know we have non-invasive technology, which is the stuff that we work on, but at the same time, we also have a broader field of invasive neurotechnology as well, which allows us, you know, some of the examples I've given you are um, of restoring function. Those typically we, everyone in the world, we don't really have a, any issues with, you know, restoring function or helping us gain back some of our memory if we've lost some of the memory. But if we start to look at human augmentation and enhancement, that starts to get a little bit creepy at times and at the same time that we're pushing forward a lot of this technology technological development we are starting to pave the way for some of the opportunities around human enhancement and augmentation and it's a conversation and a dialogue we need to have at the same time because it's going to happen within a really short space of time so how do we usher in technological development in a way that's responsible that has stewardship that does engage with the broader community in which we're trying to serve. And so I think that's the biggest challenge we have with neurotechnology. It's one of um, tempering the expectations around what it is that we can and cannot do. But at the same time, when we look at some of the technologies that have the real potential to change what it means to be human, how do we have really meaningful, meaty conversations about what does this mean and, and how what, do, what safeguards do we put in place to ensure that um, you know, we are protecting the interests of um, the communities that we're trying to really improve the lives of. A huge ethical questions associated with that, Tan, I can see. But there's a lot of audience questions coming in, and we also had some submitted beforehand. So I'm just going to maybe take it in order of, of, of the conversation. And I'm going to bring you back to what you said at the very start, uh, aging world, you know, mm -hmm. Alzheimer's. So this question is, we're a very aging world, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even chronic brain injury, rehabilitation from stroke, for example, there's so many, um, there's so many ways to use your technology. But maybe the, this one, this particular um, guest is, is actually looking for uh, another example. Maybe have you looked at Alzheimer's? Have you looked at Parkinson's? Have you looked at chronic brain injury? What what kind of help can you give these people? Yeah, so we we actually support really grassroots neuroscientific research all around the world, and we support many many researchers working across 
all of these dimensions across aging, across dementia, Parkinson's, autism, some very complex diseases. We've also you know, explored working with hospitals that are looking at long COVID, um, stroke rehabilitation, trauma, all of these are, are really core parts of um, what you can explore with EEG. Emotive typically provides a tool um, and the technological um, tools really and kits that help um, our research community uh, undertake the research. And we augment um, that research with some of the, the data that we've collected as well um, over time across the world's population to help build better models to understand what's going on in the human brain. But that's that's the, the way that we, we work with many organizations. Some of the really exciting um, ex examples I have, for example, is with um, children with autism, for example. So in, in the case of um, nonverbal uh, children within the spectrum, it can be very, very difficult to know if your child actually understands language or not. But when you're measuring using a tool like this, you can actually see a very distinct signature associated with cognitive dissonance. So if you, um, you know, just say two words, let's say um, <coughs> rain and sunshine, it, those two kind of make sense together because they kind of follow on with each other. The, the child, there won't be any sort of cognitive dissonance, but I, if I say um, boat and golf, people might, the, the child might have a slightly cognitive dissonance because the two words don't really jive together, they kind of don't make sense together. And just from the signature that's, um, that comes up in the brain as a result of two words that don't really make sense together, we can discern that the child actually doesn't, uh, does understand language and can start to tailor treatment more effectively. And so there are a lot of things that we can do um, to help with um, things like that. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about some of the, the devices like this is that you can wear them for a long period of time. And so when you're looking at chronic diseases where you know scheduling an appointment with a, a physician can be very um, arbitrary, right? So it's very difficult to, you know, when you show up to have a seizure or to show up and have brain fog associated with long COVID, but if you're monitoring um, your brain over a long period of time when you're at home, then it's more likely that you will have episodes or incidences that you can then um, show to your physician. So these tools start to open up more opportunities that will be um, available to us in the near, near future, which is really where we're very excited about the, the potential of this technology in the health space. It's unbelievable, Tan. It's it's just the the spectrum that it can that it can help is just phenomenal. But are you so? Just a quick question, actually. Are what are you measuring? It's EEG. It's brain waves. Is, is it's that exactly? Yes, it's electroencephalography. So it's very easy to measure. the The challenge with um, EEG measurements is yes, it's easy to measure because it's on the surface of the scalp. You don't have to. Um, you know, put anything, no probes into your brain, but because of it, it's a very, it's a, it's a surface measurement, so it's inherently very noisy. You've got to contend with movement, muscle artifact from people just speaking, from moving their hands around, from you know, moving their body around, and so this is why large-scale brain data actually makes a really big impact because if you're looking on an individualized basis, you don't have a lot of data to correct for some of that noisy data. It becomes very, very challenged to kind of tease out what you're looking for from the myriad of noise and signal that you're collecting. Uh, I understand completely. Um, some interesting questions around volunteering for studies. So I'm presuming you have to ask people to volunteer to be controlled in your studies. But so it, a question here uh, that has come in live is how comfortable are people to volunteer to be, to be in these studies? Interestingly, we have a community um, just online uh, at labs.emotive.com, and it's it's all about uh, researchers putting up their experiments. They compensate participants for their time. Some of the experiments are even just asking for volunteers as well. But typically, we don't have any um, a lot of challenge because we are dealing with a community of people that are really intrinsically interested in their brain. We don't. And this technology today is not yet ubiquitous that's where we like it to go but it's not yet ubiquitous and so we're still talking about a community of people that are very motivated that are very interested in one discovering more about their brain 
and learning more about how it's changing over time and engaging with researchers to support neuroscience research and discovery. And so we have a community of quite um, excited participants, so to speak. So they, they will take studies on the effects of different types of news uh, media on the brain. They'll take studies on different types of emotional changes um, as a result of music or sound or you know it, it's a whole plethora of different things and it's quite um it's quite exciting quite interesting and sometimes you don't really know what the research is trying to ask because you you might go through a, a study and it you know and and I think the compensation is quite reasonable it's about a, a dollar a minute close to a dollar a minute so um people are generally quite happy to participate interesting so we are unfortunately running out of time, so I'm going to try and wrap up in terms of the future. So there's a lot of questions have come in around, and, and just before I move to the future, maybe just there's a really interesting slant here in terms of developments in creative fields. So I suppose that, that might be rather than, so this is, I suppose, in terms of human evolution, you know, in terms of art or music, I'd be curious if, if there would be. Oh my goodness, there's so many amazing um, collaborations already. At about 10 years ago, when we first re released this technology, we did a collaboration in the UK that was funded by the late Queen Elizabeth Foundation for Disabled Persons. And it was incredible. We had three um, musicians who had been um, impacted as a result of some sort of accident and trauma and so they weren't able to compose music but they were able to compose music with their mind and all the proceeds from that soundtrack actually went to supporting disabled persons so very very exciting types of um, possibilities in terms of creating music art I I love the um, the interactive nature of this so being able to allow people to walk into a an environment and change the environment based on their emotional state, that would be really, really cool for interactive experiences as well. Wow. So in the last 30 seconds, Tan, the future, what does the future look like? I mean, we've we've touched on disease, but maybe we'll bring it back in terms of human evolution. And 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 what what can we expect from brain computer interface in the future? So my what, expectation is that this technology will become very ubiquitous. You know, today we have them in the form of headphones. So imagine everything that's around the periphery of the head, whether it's helmets, VR systems, headphones, glasses, you'll actually embed EEG sensors in them, which then allows us to start to understand how the brain is changing across the whole day, the whole the, the entire life cycle. And then from there, we can start to build really sophisticated models that can support um, what we do every day, whether it be you know, taking breaks when we need to, supporting us if we've forgotten something, um, you know, prompting AI and Siri and Alexa and other tools that are also developing at fast pace um, to kind of merge with this intersection point so that we become symbiotic with our environment and in our environment just becomes a natural extension of our brain. So we kind of merge into this environment where it feels very, very, um, very natural as opposed to us and the environment as two very distinct things. So I think it's a very exciting um, new frontier where we'll you know, extend the life of our brain through a better, deeper understanding of it, but also aid in the interaction with our environment as well. Unbelievable. So maybe if we think of something, can, you know, if we think of, if we think of a week, oh, I've got that meeting next Tuesday, does that go into my diary then? You know, that that, that would be you know, incredible. Wouldn't that be convenient? It'll feel like magic. I, I, I think one day we'll probably start to expect that that will happen. It'll be my, my child's generation, my daughter's generation. I think she'll just think it and it'll probably just be, um, Amazing. the AI will kind of know and predict that. How fascinating, how amazing. It was wonderful speaking to you. And unfortunately, we are completely out of time. So sincere apologies to those of you whose questions I unfortunately didn't get to. But I really wanted to take this opportunity to say an absolutely huge thank to Tan for the most fascinating discussion today. Thank you so much, Tan. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, everyone. And thank you everyone else for joining in. Please do check out our website for our list of upcoming speakers and see you all very soon on our next hit. Thank you.